Uh, first, I got some confirmation stuff for everybody, and I'm going to hand out um, a paper that's about confirmation fees. Um, and here, uh, really, the fees are flowers and a robe. All right. There's also an option for a class photo. We take a photo of all the confirmants, um, and then also, if you'd like a, a final that's like this, uh, you can get one of those too. Okay. But it shows on here the required would be the robe and the flower. Um, but, but I think most of the kids get. Get, get, a, get a photo, and you probably have Bibles in your home, but if you say to yourself, I don't have a Bible, you should have a Bible, all right? And if you if $10 is too much, uh, Pastor Schultz will buy you a Bible, all right? But uh, here's confirmation stuff. I'll give this to everybody. Uh, even if you don't need it until next year, uh, you got it, all right? Is that a spring break beard, or is this a... Yes, my razor went on vacation, vacation. also. <laughs> it didn't make it in the bag. <laughs> And when you know they didn't sell any of them. I also, with those robes, I need to know people's heights. Do you, would you happen to know how tall you are? I'm going to pass this around. If you know how tall you are, you can fill it in. If you say to yourself, I don't know, what I'd like you to do is go home and get measured, and then call the church office and let them know. Okay? And if you don't call the church office by... Whatever date, I'll have my secretary call you. Okay. I think there's actually a tape measure up there too. If they wanted to measure. Oh, oh look at that! Okay, I still have the chairs. You may. You may. Yeah. And there's chairs in my office too. If you want to take those. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'll start with you. All right. And a tape measure. We'll make sure we get everybody before we go. All right. Were there any questions about confirmation testimony night? Our goal is we're going to do, we're doing the third article right now, okay? So we're going to do the second part today, the third part next week, and then we'll have one week and we'll do, um, uh, we'll review, okay? I'm really sorry for that. No, here. And we might need then the rest of these chairs. Take that one. But okay. then there's at least three in my office. You're welcome to grab, okay? Okay, thank you. Yep. And I believe the portfolios are due today, is that right? If you don't have them done this week, that's okay. Bring them to me next week. Okay? All right. So try to get them done by next week. If you do have it done, feel free to leave it here on the on the table when you leave, or give a hand it to me. Uh, but seriously, next week will be just as fine. Okay? Then, with that said, we are on uh, the third article: of the Holy Spirit. This sheet. You remember the sheet? You need one, I got a couple extras. Yep. Got one for you girls. Pastor, yep. do you want them to take their notes out of there before they turn their binder in so they have one for the question? Just that's, okay. that's a great question, too. Um, let me think about that for a moment. That's what we'll probably do. Yeah. Uh, I hope uh, someone's going to do my first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, let, me, let me think about that for just a moment. <laughs> Technical testimony night before confirmation. Mm -hmm. So here's what I suggest to you all that are here. Don't turn in your binder panel, okay? Keep your binder with all your notes in it, all right? <clears throat> and I'll collect them the week after testimony night, okay? But, but here, here's the thought. We just want you to get them done, all right? We purposely picked the date today in case you didn't have it done. I had more weeks to house you, okay? So what I'd suggest is just get it done, all right? And then after testimony night, uh, probably that next Sunday, uh, I'll collect them. All right, uh, just to make sure you, you got all this stuff up. Sounds like a good plan? All right, thank you, Jamal. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. All right, hey, we're in the third article. And uh, remind me, uh, yeah. uh, the first article is about God the, say it out loud, Father, good. Uh, the second article is about God the, good. And the third article is about, 
Holy Spirit, right? That's where we're on the Holy Spirit. Here, I'll also hand you this. And thank you for your paper. And I'm going to give this to your mom. This is about confirmation stuff, robes. And there's a sheet going around about how tall he is. Actually, he can wear his brothers. He wore clothes? They're perfect. Yep, we just tried it on that too long. Did you? Yeah. All right. Yeah, just perfect. That's great. All right. So first article about God the Father, second article God the Son, third article the Holy Spirit. He had said that as we talk about now the Holy Spirit, there, there's five main points in this article. In the third article, what, what's one of the one of the what's one of the things we're talking about in the third article? What's the big one we're talking about today? We talked about him last time. The Holy Spirit, right? All right. This is the, the front part of your sheet, right, from last time. So the five points of the third article, the Holy Spirit. What's the other thing we're talking about? Yes. Yeah, that's one of the things, the resurrection of the body. Good. Give me another one. All right. Hey, let's do this. Uh, turn to the front of your sheet I handed you. Let's read together the third article together. All right? The bold at the very top. Are you ready? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll pause there. Uh, so here in this third article, there's going to be lots of things we're going to talk about. Uh, we said the Holy Spirit. Uh, another one would be the church, right? Uh, the church and the communion of saints. That's kind of one thing. We're going to talk about the forgiveness of sins. Jackson, you said the resurrection of the body. And then that last one is going to be the life everlasting, right? What is, what's heaven look like? Uh, we can talk about that next time. All right, so we're talking um, about the Holy Spirit first. And who is the Holy Spirit? What person of Trinity? Yeah, the third person, right? right? He, he's not the Father, he's not the Son, he, he's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And we call him the Holy Spirit. Why is he called holy? He doesn't sin. He doesn't sin, right? He's God, he doesn't sin, right? Good. All right, and let's see... Uh, why do you need the Holy Spirit to bring you to faith? Any thoughts? Brock? Because you're a sinner. Yeah, because you're a sinner, right? And to share just a little bit more about that, you know, we had on um, um, uh, number four, because we're born spiritually blind, dead, and an enemy of God, right? I had said last time the illustrations as if I'm blindfolded, and Jesus is at that back door over there, and I have to get to Jesus without running into anything else, right? That'd be kind of impossible to get to that back door without bumping into something, right? That's what sin does. Sin, sin blinds us, and it keeps us from getting to Jesus, okay? Uh, Martin Luther talks about this. He calls uh, sin makes us belly button gazers. I love that term. And the point is sin, it curves you in on yourself, right? It's all about me. That's kind of what sin does. It makes it all about me. I think a lot of the times when we sin, that's kind of what happens, right? Uh, Mom and Dad tell you to clean your room, and you say no, breaking fourth commandment, right? And what's the sin? Well, I don't want to, right? That doesn't sound like fun to me. I'd rather watch Walking Dead or whatever shows on TV, right? I'd rather do something like that. I don't want to do that. That doesn't sound good to me. That's all about me, right? That's what sin does. And so the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit takes someone who's a belly button gazer, only focused about me, and the Holy Spirit grabs you by the hand, and he brings you over to Jesus, right? So by myself, there's no way I'm getting to Jesus. There's no way I'm getting home to eternal life. I have to have Jesus to help me, okay? All right. Uh, and then a, a letter B there for number four. Apart from the Holy Spirit, I actively resist. I resist the gospel's call to faith. Right? So not only can I not find Jesus on my own, but I'm not even really trying. Right? It's really all about me. We had talked that about a, a story in Acts chapter 16 about a woman named Lydia. Remind me about that story. Uh, what does Lydia sell? 
Yeah. Purple goods. Purple goods, yeah, right? And if you sell purple, are you rich or poor? Rich. Rich, right. Uh, uh, purple is very hard to get, so that color at this time. And so if you have purple, you got a lot of money. Only kings buy the color purple, right? That's how much it costs. And so Lydia, because she sells purple, has a lot of money. And you remember how she comes to faith. She's just sitting down, and she's listening to Paul share the faith, and she hears, and she believes, and she says, hey, I think I should be baptized. And she's baptized, and she believes in the Lord, right? She doesn't have to take a test on all the facts about Jesus. Uh, she doesn't have to sit through confirmation for two years, right? Confirmation doesn't give you faith. It strengthens faith. Uh, but she hears the word, and she comes to faith. <laughs> All right, we had talked then about tools that God uses, right? And we were told last time that tools have functions, right? If I want to put paint on the wall, what tool do I need? Paintbrush, right? <clears throat> Again, I could get preschoolers and use their hands. That'd be pretty messy, so I'd use a paintbrush. If I wanted to, you don't have one in this room, that's weird, hang a cross on the wall, uh, what would I use to put the nail on the wall? Hammer, right? I can maybe push with my finger as hard as I can, but my, my hand would hurt and it might not actually go into the wall, right? Uh, if I decide this table's too big and I want to cut it in half, how would I cut it in half? Saw, right? I need a tool, right? In a similar way, the Holy Spirit uses tools to bring you to faith, okay? He doesn't come to confirmation class and talk to you, uh, He doesn't zap you with knowledge. Uh, he doesn't give you a, a dream and explain it all to you, but he uses tools, or what we call means, he uses means to convert and to sanctify, right? To bring you to faith. He's going to use a tool to bring you to faith. We call these the means of grace. What are the means of grace? Give me one of them. Brock. The Word. The Word, right? I, and the Word, um, it's the Bible. Right? So one of the one of the things that the word is, the word is the Bible. And so I can read the Bible and I can come to faith in Jesus. Right? The Spirit works through the words to bring me to faith. Okay? So if nobody ever told me, I could read it and come to faith, right? But the other part of the word is not just the written word, it's also the spoken word, right? So when the pastor gives a sermon on Sunday, uh, that is the word of God. Even though the pastor wrote out the sermon, he didn't maybe even reference the Bible, uh, he is summarizing, explaining the scriptures, and that's the Word of God. And so when you're at school, and your friend comes to you and says, you know, uh, I don't understand this whole Jesus thing, or uh, really you don't believe the earth is a billion years old, um, and you share with them your faith, even if you never open a Bible or share with them a, a Bible verse, that is sharing God's word. And God works through that word to bring someone to faith. Okay? So one of the tools that the Holy Spirit uses is the word. That's the written word and the spoken word. All right? That's one. He's got three of them. Give me another tool that he uses. Yeah. Baptism. Baptism. Right? This is one of my favorites. Baptism. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to understand. It seems so simple. God uses a little bit of water. Right? And it just comes right out of the sink. Uh, if you're ever wondering that, that's where we get it from. We pour it right out of the sink. Um, and normally we, we actually use hot water. So by the time we get to the service, it cools down. Uh, cold water on babies, they often scream. Uh, but, but we use a little bit of water, and then we use God's Word, right? Uh, it's a lot of it goes back to the Word. So the Word, right? So I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, on that <coughs> the word uh, connected to the water, and God promises um, the gift of faith. Pretty cool. And that's how we baptize babies, right? Because God promises that even babies can have faith. And so uh, the Spirit uses the word to bring us to faith, and he uses baptism to bring us to faith. I bet most of you are baptized as babies, right? Right? And so you've always just been part of the faith, right? You've always believed. It's just what you do. And that's what baptism does. It strengthens our faith. What is the other means, the other tool that the Holy Spirit uses? Communion. communion, right? And communion is kind of a special tool. It's given for those who already believe, right? 
Uh, communion's for the baptized. Um, baptism, we, we enter into the family of God, and Holy Communion, we're strengthened in that family. Okay? But in communion, God promises that he's actually forgiving <clears throat> sins, uh, that he's connecting us to Christ, and he promises to us eternal life. So it's more than just uh, 20 more minutes on, of church on Sunday. Uh, communion's pretty cool. Communion, God is actually at work forgiving your sins. When you didn't listen to mom and dad the night before, boom, you're forgiven on Sunday morning. When you've been messing up a lot at school, boom, you're forgiven here on Sunday morning. Pretty cool. Uh, so these are the three tools, the word, <clears throat> baptism, and holy communion that God uses to strengthen faith and to bring people to faith. All right, those are the only tools that the Holy Spirit uses, okay? Now that's kind of important because sometimes you'll hear people say things like this. Um, I went out on a nature hike, and on the nature hike, I saw the beauty of God's creation, and my faith was just strengthened so much. Well, that's not how it works, right? How does the Holy Spirit bring us to faith? The Word, Holy Communion, and Baptism. Right? That's where our faith is strengthened. Uh, that's where uh, God leads us uh, to the faith. Okay? So those are the three tools the Holy Spirit uses. We call them the means of grace. All right? and, and, and we call it a means as a tool um, because... Jesus wins for us this forgiveness during Holy Week, right? On Good Friday, on Easter Sunday, he wins forgiveness. And then how does that forgiveness get applied to my life? On uh, these means, these tools, okay? Questions about the means of grace? Something you've always wanted to know. Okay. All right. Uh, we had talked about another word. Uh, we have justification, right? Do you remember what justification means? Just as if I never sinned, right? It's all about being forgiven, right? I'm made right because of what Jesus has done. And then we got a new word last time. It was called sanctification. Do you remember what sanctification means, Brock? To make holy. Uh, to make holy, right? And sanctification, we said, is a process. Uh, it, it doesn't happen right away, right? When will I be perfectly holy? Home in heaven, right? Home in heaven. Right? I'll be perfectly holy, home in heaven. However, with the Spirit working in my life, I can actually um, live a God-pleasing life. Right? And because the Spirit's working in my life and it's no longer all about me, uh, now I can actually choose to do God's will. So if I'm at Walmart and that snicker bar looks really good and I want to steal it, the Holy Spirit working in my heart will tell me, no, you shouldn't steal it. Right? When mom's being crazy and you want to talk back to mom, the Holy Spirit working in your heart should encourage you, no, that's not how I should talk to mom, uh, even if she's being crazy. Right? So that's what sanctification is. It, it's uh, this, this process of making us holy. We kind of said last time then that it, that it looks kind of like this, right? So if here... Well, if here is um, eternal life, and here is, oh, I don't know, here's when you're born, and then for most of you, you're baptized as babies, okay? So right here, I'm going to write uh, justification. So justification always comes before sanctification, all right? And justification means being forgiven, right? So in my baptism, as a means of grace, the Holy Spirit enters my life, and I become a forgiven child of God, right? So for me, I was baptized when I was nine days old, and boom, the Holy Spirit enters my life, and I'm part of God's family, all right? So I'm, I'm forgiven, okay? So justification really only happens one time. I'm justified in my baptism. And then, our Christian life, this process of being made holy sanctification, right? Maybe this whole line that is sanctification. And sanctification is a process, right? So some days, man, I'm doing really good. 
and then, and then all of a sudden I have, a, I have several bad days, right? And that can be doing really good, and then I can plateau for a while, and then do good again, and then man, I did something really bad, and I just can't get out of it, and then I'm doing better again, and then some way along the line I get to here, the moment I die, uh, and then I get to eternal life with Jesus, and then there I am perfectly holy uh, in Christ, right? That's the symbol for Christ. So that's kind of sanctification. <coughs> it's a process. Um, are you always going to do good things on this side of eternity? No, right? You're a sinner. But are you able to do good things sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. So let's jump down to number 10. All right? So number 9, uh, once you've been given the Holy Spirit, will you live perfectly? No. Nope. Right? I'm not going to live perfectly because my body is still affected with sin. And I live in a fallen, sinful world. Right? So I'm still affected by sin. Uh, number 10, so you are at the same time a saint and a sinner. All right, did we say that one last time? Oh, we got that far? Good. All right, how am I, how am I a sinner? That one should be obvious. Because we sin, right? I live in a fallen, sinful world. I'm a sinner. All right, so how am I a sinner? I still sin. I still sin. All right. And so then how are you a saint? Right? Well, remind me, what does saint mean? A saint is anyone who has faith in Jesus. Right? A saint is one who has been forgiven. Uh, the word saint actually uh, just means, uh, it means holy, all right? So a saint means holy, and how do I become holy if I'm forgiven by Jesus, right? If my sins are forgiven, uh, that makes me holy, okay? So how am I a saint? Because of Jesus, I'm forgiven, right? Because of Jesus, I'm forgiven. So we call this a paradox. Do you know what paradox means? A paradox is when two things are true and they seem in uh, conflict with one another, right? There's some tension, right? How can two things be true at the same time? And so uh, I am a saint and a sinner at the same time. And how does that work? Well, I, I live in a fallen, sinful world. I continue to mess up. And yet, Christ died for me, forgave me all of my sins. And so already now, I am a saint. I'm a child of God. I'm already justified, right? Even before the last day, I'm already justified. So I'm a saint, fully forgiven, but I'm going to continue to sin until called home to eternal life. Okay? Now, another uh, thing about this, it's not as if some days I'm a sinner and some days I'm a saint. Okay? So it's not like, you know, I was pretty good today. I said hi to Max when he came in the room. Uh, maybe I'd bring donuts for the class one day. Uh, I was a really nice person. And so today I'm being a saint. But then tomorrow, well, I'm going to trip Jackson, uh, push Brock down the stairs, uh, say something <coughs> mean to my kids, and, uh, and the like. And well, then I'm a sinner. No, 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 no. The way this works is I am 100% a sinner and 100% a saint right now. Right? I am one who is fully affected by sin, but one who is fully forgiven by my Savior, Jesus. All right. Uh, so question 13. So how do good works play into this, right? So if I'm a saint, and I'm living by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm living a, we call it a Christian life, uh, good works then do not gain our salvation. Right? Good works do not gain our salvation. Instead, they help our neighbor. Okay? They do not gain our salvation, they help our neighbor. So all of this, this uh, sanctification, uh, sometimes we call it uh, the Christian life, right? How I live as a child of God. Um, all of this. It doesn't gain my salvation, right? How am I saved? 
because uh, I've been justified, right? I have the Holy Spirit. I have faith in Jesus, okay? So, so when I do good works, when I'm up here doing good things, uh, that doesn't gain my salvation, right? Uh, being a great person doesn't make me get more things in heaven. Uh, instead, they help our neighbor, okay? So I don't do good things so that I can get good things in return, right? Uh, that's not how the Christian faith works. I don't not push you down the stairs because uh, then Jesus will push me down the stairs into hell. Uh, I don't push you down the stairs because I'm a child of God. And that's not how God's people live, okay? Another way I, I like to think about this is it's being part of the family, right? And so I remember growing up, and when I do something wrong, uh, my father would say, uh, that's not how people in this family act, right? I don't care what Johnny's house does. That's not how we act in this family. Well, in a similar way, that's how the people of God live, right? As we live in the family of God, some things are not how, are not how God's people act, right? The fam it's not how the family acts. So the family isn't going to be lazy and not do our homework, right? Because as a Christian, uh, we're called to be good students, right? Uh, the Christian isn't going to bully or make fun of someone else because that's not how the family acts, right? Uh, the family is going to love and support one another because Christ died for us. And I'm going to love and care for people, not because I have to get to heaven, but because this is how someone in the family acts, right? That's, that's kind of how it works. I wrote down for you that about good works. I thought it was too long to make you write it, but I'll read it for you. Uh, good works in God's eyes is everything that a child of God does, speaks, or thinks in faith according to the Ten Commandments for the glory of God and for the benefit of his or her neighbor. Okay, So good works uh, in God's eyes are things done in faith. Uh, so let's go down to that last point. From Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So good works that aren't done in faith actually aren't good works at all. So for the person that donates $10 million to Riley Hospital to help children with cancer, but isn't a believer in the Lord, that actually doesn't even count as a good work. Right? Uh, good works are those done in faith uh, for the betterment of our neighbor. All right, questions about the Holy Spirit? Okay. All right, hey, I got another sheet for you all. And we move on uh, to a fun topic, I think, the church. Talking about the church. If I said the word church to you, what comes to your mind? Give me some thoughts. Uh, this is from something else. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Did I hand you that? Yeah. I'm no, sorry. No, that was we, yeah. the week before. The week before. Okay. So we do a week of 14. Uh, this? Oh, I lost the sheet. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, that's good. We'll do the first one, and then let go of the <coughs> For now. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had myself. So the last sheet on, the, on, that, on that front side, it says 2KR. Uh, 2KR is um, oh, theological jargon, perhaps. All right? And it means two kinds of righteousness. And I think 2KR demonstrates really well for us um, uh, how this works with justification and sanctification and how I live as a child of God. So I gave you a lot of space. I want you to draw something with me. All right? I want you to draw you first. Draw you down to the bottom. All right? So down to the bottom, uh, draw you. And you're happy because life's gone. All right? So down at the bottom, draw you. All right. I probably didn't hand you all sheets, um, Alex. And
then I want you to write, or you can draw, but probably just write God. Okay. All right. Now we have that word again, justification, right? Being justified, right? How am I forgiven with God? Right? I'm a sinner. I've broken God's rules. How am I forgiven? Yes. Baptism's good, which connects me to who? Someone said it. Say it louder. Which person in Trinity? Jesus, right? All right, so how am I forgiven? And, and you're right on baptism, right? I'm connected to Jesus. But I'm forgiven purely because of what Jesus has done for me. So I want you to sign, and we're going to make this symbol for Christ again, all right? So it looks like this, kind of a P and an X. And you remember that's because in Greek, the word for Christ is Christos, right? That means Christ. And the first two letters, the chi and the rho, uh, make Christ, all right? So that's an abbreviation for Christ. Uh, you could also, if you wanted to, you could just draw a cross, right? Because what has Christ done for me? He dies on the cross, and he rises from the grave, all right? So the arrow, look, look which direction the arrow is coming. It's only going down. Do I, do I do anything for my salvation? No, right? There's no arrow going up. Um, I can be a poor, miserable sinner like I am, and I'm still forgiven because of what Jesus has done for me. Okay? So if you are a murderer, can you still be forgiven? Yeah, because it's not about you, right? It's about Jesus, right? And even if I'm Hitler, right? Let's go pretty extreme here. I'm Hitler. I've killed six million Jews and so many other people. Um, but if I confess Christ before I die, I come to, to true faith in the Lord, am I home in heaven? Yeah, right? Because it's not about me. It's about faith in Christ. Okay? Uh, Hitler, we're pretty sure, is not in heaven, okay? Uh, he had no claim to Christianity. All right, so this is justification, okay? It's all about what God does for me. It's all about Jesus, okay? Sanctification uh, then works this way. I want you to draw some arrows. I think you draw some more people. This is your friend. They get a smile too because you love them. Did I not give you guys sheets either? Ah, well, okay. You've already started drawing. That's good. All right. And this again is called, I call it 2KR or two kinds of righteousness. So I'm righteous before God, forgiven, purely because of what Jesus has done. Okay? However, you'll notice which way the air is pointing this time, right? However, with the Holy Spirit, since I've been forgiven, and the Holy Spirit's working in my heart, I now do, right? I actually can do things. It's a process of being made holy. And now I'm going to do good works for my neighbor. So when I see that my neighbor needs their lawn mowed, and she's a feeble old lady, I'm going to mow the lawn, right? Because that's what God's called me to do. It's being part of the family. Uh, when I see that, um, oh, I don't know, Claire dropped her confirmation binder and her papers went everywhere, I'm going to stop and help you, because that's what people in the family do, right? So here, God does all of it to save me, but once I'm a child of God, now I'm going to help other people right? Helping other people, it doesn't save me, right? It doesn't get me back to God, but I help other people because of what God has done for me. Does that kind of make sense? Right? Um, so I'm saved because of what God has done, and because God has loved me in Jesus, now I'm going to help other people. Okay? So this is one righteousness and then a second righteousness, right? I'm righteous before others, uh, with how I treat them, right? All right. Hey, uh, back to the church then, okay? Uh, if I said the word church, tell me what you think of. Oh, give me some thoughts. No wrong answers. What do you think of with the church? 
Yes, Brock. That's where the Christians go. Ah, that's where Christians go. Good, I like that. Somebody else? Yeah. Baptism. Baptism. Right, those are in church. Good. Somebody else? Come on, we're in church. What do you think about? Yes. House of God. House of God? I like that. Do you know another name for House of God? What else do we call it? We call it church, House of God. Do you know any other names? Sanctuary. Good. Uh, what else do you think of church? Yeah, Diana. Congregation. Congregation. Good. Sarah. Cross. Cross, right? All those things happen in the church. Good. And so here's my point. When we talk about <clears throat> church, sometimes we mean different things, right? And kind of more specifically, sometimes when I say church, I mean the place that we worship, right? Sometimes when I say church, I mean like a denomination, right? Like what church do you go to? Oh, I go to St. Peter's Lutheran, or I go to St. Jude Catholic, or I go to Pathways Non-Denominational Church. Uh, sometimes we talk about church as a verb, right? Doing something. Like if I asked you, what did you do today? You might say, well, I woke up, you know, ate breakfast, I had church, then I went to Kroger, went to Kohl's, and then went home, right? Well, you had church, right? Well, what does that mean? Uh, but we can use it as a verb. In the Apostles' Creed, in this third article, we confess, I believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Christian Church. Well, what do we mean by the church? All right, that's our first question. And, and here's the answer. Are you ready? It's the total number of saints, right? That word saints again. And then parentheses, I'm sure, believers, right? That's what saints means. It means believers. So it's the total number of saints slash believers who believe in Christ. The total number of saints who believe in Christ. Yes? Is that what they refer to as the invisible church? Oh, we're getting to that. Oh, yeah, and, and, and you're right. So you're right. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then I, I don't want to confuse you too much with all this jargon, okay? But I think this is important. Sometimes we talk about church with a capital C. And sometimes I'm a church with a lowercase c, okay? Uh, capital C church is what we talk about in the Apostles' Creed. The church, right? Maybe, maybe we talk about it like that. The church. So the church is everybody who believes in Jesus, all right? When we talk about a church, maybe we mean St. Peter's Lutheran Church or St. Jude Catholic Church or the like, all right? So there's the church, everyone who believes and then there's the individual local congregation. Does that make sense? All right. So what's the Holy Christian Church? The total number of saints who believe in Christ. Uh, why is it called the Holy Christian Church? Why is it called holy? What do you think? Yeah? Because it uses God's word. That is a great guess. That's not right, but that's a great guess. Uh, that, that's actually a really good direction you're going with. Uh, here's the answer. It's made up of holy people. It's made up of holy people, believers, who have been forgiven by Christ. It's made up of holy people, believers, who have been forgiven by Christ. It's made up of holy people, believers who have been forgiven by Christ. Right? This goes back to that saint and sinner idea, right? Uh, I might be a sinner, but I'm also a saint, right? And so the church, which is the people, are made up of sinful people, but they're holy because uh, Jesus has forgiven their sins. Okay? Uh, why is the church called Christian? Didn't we get that word in the Bible, actually? It comes in Acts. Uh, the church in Antioch is the first place where they're called Christians. And they're called Christians because um, it belongs to Christ, right? It belongs to Christ. Right? Christians, uh, of course, it's Christ, right? So it belongs to Christ. All right, now where can you find the church? Give me some thoughts. Where can you find the church? Don't write anything down yet. 
brought where only Christians get together. Where Christians gather together. Good. You're on the right track. And you're on the right track, but I need you to take just one step further, right? Because Christians gather together in other places too, right? You might have at your house, you have friends over, all the friends are there are Christians, right? And so in some sense you have the church there, but, but that'd be different than how we normally think of the church gathering, right? So when I'm trying to find the church, how do I find it? Yeah. Christians gather together to worship God. Yeah, good, good. You're right on track, and I want you to write this down. It's where the gospel, where the gospel is purely taught. Where the gospel is purely taught. Where the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. Where the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. Correctly administered. What's another way to say the gospel and the sacraments? Right, the gospel be the word of God, the sacraments, baptism, communion. What else do we call that? The means of grace, right? Where do I find the church? Around the means of grace. Around the place where God promises to be at work in our lives. Okay? So where do I find the church? Surrounded by the means of grace. So, uh... Yeah, you'll hear people say things like this sometimes. Um, I don't need to go to church. I can worship God on my own on the golf course. On the golf course, are the means of grace there? No, right? They're not there. Uh, you got to be with God's people around the means of grace. All right. And we've talked about this a little bit, but let's look, let's look at number five. In what other sense is the word church used? Uh, letter A, um, a visible church of God, right? A, a church you can see, a building. A visible church of God. How else is the word church used? A denomination. Right? Denomination would be like Lutheran, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, non-denominational. Uh, so denomination. Uh, let us see a local congregation. So not just the Lutheran church as a whole, but St. Peter's Lutheran church. So a local congregation. And finally, letter D, uh, Brock, you had said this, a house of worship, right? The sanctuary, the place we gather together to worship the Lord. We also talk about church in uh, two other ways. We talk about the church being visible and invisible, okay? What do you think a visible church is? Don't overthink it. Yeah? The building. Building. You're on the right track. Good. Jackson? The building that Christians worship God. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. So sometimes the visible church is the church you can see, right? And so I write this down. It's the total number of people who claim to be Christian. Right? The total number of people who claim to be Christian. I believe currently there are 2 billion people in the world who claim to be Christian. I think that's right. Half of them are Catholic. Okay, so, so the amount of people who claim to be Christian, who confess, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, right? That's who the visible church is. What do you think the invisible church is? Jackson? There's not a number of people that are actually Christian. Yeah, you're right. So I'd write this down, those who truly believe. Those who truly <coughs> believe. And so it's a sad reality, but there are those who claim to be Christians who really don't have faith, right? Uh, there are those, sadly, who I bet even come to church here at St. Peter's who truthfully don't have faith. Uh, maybe they're here because someone makes them come. Uh, maybe they're here and, and they get it all wrong. Think that they have to, I erase it, but they have to do something to get to heaven, right? That would be getting it wrong. Um, and then there are those who gather here who truly have faith in the Lord, right? How do I know who's part of the, of the visible church and who's part of the invisible church? How do I know who truly has faith? You don't. You don't. Good. 
right? You, you don't, right? And so the goal of the pastor isn't to say, hmm, uh, you know, Jeremy, I think you're really out. We should talk, and I'm, you can't come anymore, right? No, right? We, and all of us, actually, we continue to, to spread the word, right? And the parable of the sower, how he sows the seed, right? He throws it all over the place. He's so generous. He never says, well, I'm not going to waste my time on Alex because you're a lost cause, right? No, that's not how it works. Uh, we, the, we sow the word. We share the gospel generously to everybody. And on the last day, the Lord will work it all out, right? And so on this side of eternity, we don't really know who's truly a believer and who's truly not. Because I can't see someone's heart, right? Only the Lord can. And so if they come and say, I'm a Christian, we treat them as Christians, okay? Now, how many churches are there? There's a visible church and an invisible church. How many churches are there? It's meant to be a trick question. Yes? One. There's one, right? What is the true church? <clears throat> the invisible church, right? It's the believers who have true faith in Christ, right? So the true church that we confess in the creed, we talk about the church, it's everyone who believes in Jesus. All right, but there's really just one church. All right, as we live in the life in the church, uh, we live in this process of sanctification, this Christian living. And so what's our goal in the life of the church? Number nine, our goal is to maintain a sincere faith. All right? Our goal in the church is to have true faith. Our goal, letter B, is to find a faithful denomination. Faithful denomination. Our goal is to avoid false teachers. And our goal is to extend the church and home to the ends of the earth. All right, so how do I find a faithful denomination? Got any thoughts for me? You can trust mom and dad. I guess, right? They keep coming here. Oh, that'd be good. Uh, but if you are, are searching for a church, and in your little town, uh, or big town, Fort Wayne, there's a Catholic church, and a Lutheran church, and a Baptist church, and a Methodist church, and a Pentecostal church, an Assembly of God church, a United Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, a non-denominational church, another non-denominational church, uh, how do I know which church is faithful to the scriptures? What would you do? Yeah. Go with what's inside your heart. Go with what's inside your heart. Yeah, you know, I like where you're going. You know the problem with that, though, is my heart's sinful, isn't it? And so my heart might say things like this. I really like that pastor. He's really engaging. Maybe I should go there. Well, maybe the pastor's a really good speaker, but maybe he's not teaching what the Bible says, right? And so the heart isn't always a great place to trust, right? Uh, so our goal in finding a faithful denomination is this. I'm going to compare what do they teach with what the Bible says, right? An example I sometimes give is this. If I wrote out for you Pastor Schultz's uh, 10 rules of confirmation class, all right? And I had you all write them down, all right? And when he wrote them down, the, the craziest thing happened. They were all different, right? Some of you only wrote down six rules. I don't know how you did that, but you only got six out of ten. Some of you mixed up the order. Some of you added rules. There were like 12 rules on your sheets. Uh, some of you took the rules and then like embellished them a little bit, right? Or if I said maybe, um, oh, no cell phones uh, during class, uh, you wrote down, you can't ever have a cell phone ever because cell phones are from the devil, right? <laughs> uh, that's not what I said, right? And so when I collect all the rules, uh, they're all different. How would you know whose rules matched up to the ones I gave? What would you do? You compare the list, right? You would take your list, and you'd take my list, and you'd see whose were right. right? Hey, that's what we do too. Uh, we have God's word, and we compare it to, uh, to what the teachings of the church are. All right? So I'll be very clear here. I'm not bashing other denominations. All right? uh, other denominations are faithful Christians 
um, who will one day be home in heaven. But they don't all teach what God's Word says. And so if you go to Baptist church, and they say they don't baptize babies until they're like 13. Well, we look at the Bible and say, is that what the Bible says? Because in, um, in Acts chapter 10, when uh, Peter and Cornelius meet, we're told the entire household is baptized, including babies, right? Uh, when we're told that that, that first Pentecost day, when the Spirit comes upon the people, that 3,000 people are baptized, the Scripture doesn't say, but only those who are 12 years and older, right? No, the Scripture says everyone's baptized. And so we look at a church like that and say, you know, that's just not right. When we look at another church like the Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church says, you know, communion, it's really a cool meal, because when we take communion, we get to think about what Jesus did for us, and it's kind of fun to think about Jesus. Well, we would say, well, no, wait a minute. Communion does more than just remind us about Monday, Thursday. Communion is a means of grace. It actually forgives my sins. It actually connects me to Christ. It gives me the Holy Spirit, and it's going to strengthen me in this life on my journey home to eternal life. And so, you know, Methodist Church probably isn't the right church for me. And I'm a big believer. I'm probably biased because I'm a Lutheran pastor. But the Lutheran Church does the best job of teaching what the Scriptures say. All right? So that's how we find a faithful denomination. We want to compare it to what the Bible says. So when you go to high school and you have friends who are Baptists and Catholics, maybe you have that now. But when you go off to college one day and have all these questions, uh, do what you do. You call your pastor. Okay? I've had four uh, college kids call me this year already and ask me about things. Hey, Pastor, I'm going to a church here and they don't baptize babies. I think, I think we're doing it wrong. Uh, no, we'll talk and we'll get coffee and we'll figure all those things out, okay? Um, so that's how we find a faithful denomination. You have questions about that? All right. Uh, you've heard my other spiel, but I'll share this with you too. Sometimes then the next question to that conversation is, but wait a minute, Pastor, you said the Baptists are going to heaven and the Catholics are going to heaven. And the non-denominational people are going to heaven. So if we're all going to heaven, does it really matter what church we go to? Uh, and I would suggest to you that's the wrong question to ask, right? Let me give you another example. Uh, do I still need to be part of the Schultz family if I got mad and yelled at my dad? Right? I, I do. But was that, was that appropriate? Should I do it? Could I still be part of the family if I snuck out at night and went to a party? Right? I'd still be part of the family, right? They'd let me sleep in a bed at their house still, right? So I could sleep part of the family. Could I be part of the family if I wrecked the car? I could, right? But should I ever say to myself, hey, I'm going to wreck the car. This would be a good idea. Let's see what happens. No. Should I ever say I'm going to purposely not listen to mom and dad? No. The goal is to, um, is to be a faithful follower of the family of the scriptures. And so if... Um, if the goal then is to have a, a good life, a healthy life, right? <clears throat> can I still be alive if I drink 12 cans of Mountain Dew a day? Yeah. Probably not good for me, though, is it? Yeah, as I'm drinking my, my Coke. Uh, probably not good for me, <laughs> all right? So in a similar sense, can I still get to heaven if I get prayer wrong? If I think prayer is about how I can manipulate God into doing whatever I want, kind of like magic? Sure, you can still go to heaven. But, but, but life's not as good. Can I still get to heaven if I mess up on baptism? I get it wrong. I think you've got to be 12. And that it's really just confirming your faith. It doesn't actually give you anything. Sure. And if I cut off my arm, am I still alive? Yeah, if I cut off my other arm, can I still be alive? Yeah, and if I get Holy Communion wrong too, I get baptism wrong and communion wrong, can I still get to heaven? Yeah, right? Because I have the Word, right? The three means of grace. Baptism, communion, and the word, right? Um, so if I, if I still have the word, so what I, we would argue those would be non-denominational churches. They don't get baptism right. They don't get communion right. But they have the word. All right? And as long as they got the word, uh, the gospel, they can still get to heaven. If I, well, what else can I get wrong? Uh, if I get wrong, oh, I don't know, uh, how pastors work, right? If I think the pastor is an employee that I get to hire and fire, and his job is just to make me happy, and anytime he says anything that I don't like to hear, I should get rid of him. Can I still get to heaven? Sure, I guess, right? I cut off my leg. I can still get to heaven too, right? Uh, the pastor's job, by the way, 
is to take the means of grace, those three tools, and to give them to the people. That's my entire job. My job is not to pick out what carpet to put in the church or what color we should paint the wall. Uh, my job is to give you God's gifts. That's why God gives us pastors. All right? So I'm down to no arms and one leg. And uh, if I get worship wrong, I think worship is about what I do instead of what God gives to me, his gifts. Can I still get to heaven? Yeah, now I have no arms and no legs. Life's pretty hard. And if I get Jesus wrong, if I don't understand that he's my savior, uh, can I get to heaven? No. <laughs> right? So you cut off my head, I'm done. Right? So, so can I still get to heaven on part of another church? Well, of course you can. But is life is good? No, it's really good to have two arms. Right? I really enjoy eating, talking, uh, playing piano, and the like. Okay? That's kind of how life in the church works. Got questions about that? I know for many of us, we have family members who are part of other denominations. I do too. Right? I have members in the ELCA church, uh, that other Lutheran church. I have members in my family who are Catholic and Baptist and the like. Okay? And I'm rejoicing home in heaven. Uh, we'll all believe the same thing, be united in Jesus. All right? So we look forward to that day. All right. Uh, forgiveness of sins. Uh, what is the forgiveness of sins? It's God's promise. God's promise. That for Christ's sake, right, God's promise that because of Jesus, that for Christ's sake, he will not hold our sins against us. God's promise that for Christ's sake, he will not hold our sins against us. He will not hold our many sins against us. Hey, why does God forgive sins? Give me a thought. Yeah. Yeah, that's really the answer. He loves us, and because of Jesus' sacrifice. Right? He loves us, and because of Jesus' sacrifice. Um, Jackson, you hit that right on uh, the nail on the head. Um, there's no reason he should forgive us, Right? Uh, we haven't sinned just once. We've sinned over and over and over again. And he purely sends Jesus because he loves us. Uh, but that second part, because of Jesus' sacrifice, is important too. Um, our sins are forgiven not because God says, well, whatever, I guess it doesn't really matter. It's not because God kind of sees you sinning and goes, oh, I missed that. Uh, you know, shape up and I'll look again, right? No, no, no. How are sins forgiven? They have to be paid for, right? So he loves us, and he sends Jesus to a cross, right? So how are my sins forgiven? Because Jesus takes my sins from me, right? He takes the punishment I deserve. Uh, it's like two brothers. The one brother messes up. The punishment's going to be a spanking, and the other brother says, I'll take the spanking for him. Does that ever happen? No, right? Brothers never do that. Right? Uh, in in a, a similar way, I suppose. But that's what Jesus does. Jesus sees we've all messed up, and he says, I'll take the punishment. The punishment has to be given. Right? That's why we have Good Friday, the death on the cross. Okay? So we're forgiven because Jesus takes the punishment for us. Um, and lastly, why can I be sure of the forgiveness of my sins? Um, I can be sure because... God always keeps his promises in Christ. I can be sure because God always keeps his promises in Christ. Because God always keeps his promises in Christ. God's promise to keep his promises uh, comes here from Romans 8. I want to read these words to you. St. Paul writes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, how beautiful that is. Uh, nothing in this life, not even in death, can separate me from God's love for me and Jesus.
right. Uh, we're going to pray here just a second. And then next week our plan will be to uh, finish the third article. And we're going to talk about death tomorrow or next time. All right? So I want you to think about that ahead of time. Think of some questions you might have. How does death work? Uh, some of you have probably had grandma and grandpa's die before. All right? Questions you might have like, do you become an angel when you die? Uh, we've already talked about that, right? No, we do not become an angel. Uh, but we'll talk about those kind of questions. What happens? Uh, what's eternal life look like? Do I get to dance on clouds and play a harp? Uh, do I get, you know, anything I want? Is it my mansion? Do I get to pick it? Or does it look kind of different than what I might expect? We'll talk about that next time. Uh, but join me in a word prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your grace and your mercy in your Son, Jesus Christ. We give thanks that he has risen from the dead and he promises that all who have faith in him will also rise from the dead. We give thanks for your church, the place that we gather to receive your gifts. We give thanks, O Lord, for pastors who faithfully proclaim to us your word and deliver to us the means of grace, the word, the baptism, and holy communion. We ask that you'd strengthen us with these means, that our faith may never uh, waver, but we might be bold and confident in our salvation and our Savior Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.